I'm Sheldon Neal, filling in for Lorna Duick. This week on Context, violence against women. What causes it? How do we raise your voice or our voices against it? And what's God's place in the discussion? The meteoric fall of a Canadian radio icon has resonated through every city and town in Canada. Now thousands of stories barely whispered in the darkness are being shared in the daylight of sexual violence, harassment, anger, and control. In a moment, former Deputy Prime Minister Sheila Copps shares her story of two assaults she suffered, one while serving as a member of provincial parliament. Federal Liberal Whip Judy Foote talks about the allegations that led to the suspension of two MPs. As guest host Sheldon Neal explores the cause and effect of sexual violence, its prevention, and the place of God in bringing about this long overdue attitude shift. Former Deputy Prime Minister Sheila Copps joins me now via Skype from Algeria to tell her story. Well, first let me ask, um, why are you in Algeria? Well, I'm doing a project with the National Democratic Institute in Washington. Um, they're working to try and make the white, the women parliamentarians more effective and we're here on a campaign school not just for women parliamentarians but interestingly they're working on a new piece of legislation which is uh, about family violence and I'm working with some of the, uh, the the political parties to make sure that they get the points out of the legislation that they would like so that's why I'm here. You've made a couple revelations about your past one of which that you were sexually assaulted by progressive by rather by a progressive conservative legislator more than 30 years ago. Um, you were 28 years old when it occurred. Tell us what happened. Well, at the time, we were actually doing a study on family violence, very similar to what's taking place now in Algeria, and we were doing a tour of Ontario. So we were in a riding in northern Ontario, and we had been subject to hearings all day long. In the evening, the members of Parliament eat together as a group. And after we left the table, we went upstairs, and I got off at one particular elevator floor, as did my colleague, and we walked out. I was just taking my key out to go to my room and he literally kind of jumped me, slammed me up against the wall, tried to uh, to fondle me and, and uh, kiss me and I just pushed him away, kicked him, literally lifted my knee and gave him a good swift kick and then he went away and nothing ever happened after that. That was kind of a one-time thing. He never tried it again and I never told anybody uh, because at the time I thought, well, I dealt with it and he was not going to be bothering me anymore. So. That was what happened. Now, oftentimes, these things are very private when, when it occurs, when it happens. Because it's so private, I wonder, are you more inclined to tell yourself, you know what, I'll just move on. What happened in private, I, I just want to keep it there. I think it's also, when you're in politics, it's also very difficult to go public on issues of that nature because you want to be known for the things that you stand for and the positions that you take on, on issues. You don't necessarily want to be known as a victim. Honorable a cop, so why tell this story now? Well, because I think that when the uh, when the original, I mean, if you read the the story, probably got started through the uh, news reportings that were, were carrying on about Jan Gameshi and his situation. And I I was one of the first people to come and tweet in his support. And then, as more information came out, I realized that I'd fallen prey to the very thing that I complained about with others, and that is. Uh, being uh, being judgmental at a time when I didn't have all the facts. So the column was intended to kind of look at the facts, not just from the point of view of what happens in a workplace, like at the CBC, for example, but also when it happens in Parliament, it is unique and different because there is no process. Talk about the importance of coming forward when the harassment takes place. Well, even, even though it happened to me 30 years ago when I sort of had to reconstruct in my mind what had happened in both instances. I didn't realize how how painful it still is to even think about it. I told my husband about it because I had written the column and I showed him the column before I, I sent it to my editor. And he said, whoa, this is going to create a bit of a firestorm. And I said, well, again, I, I mentioned I didn't think it was something that was so relevant today. But when I did start telling him about the details, I mean, I kind of welled up and I really felt it. And I think a lot of people don't talk about things and they keep them as a deep, dark sexual secret because there is a certain amount of guilt that you feel. And I think that when that happens, your, your instinct is to just shut up about it. And I think we have to talk about it. And hopefully by 
talking about it even in a very long past tense, um, it might be helpful to others. Honorable Sheila Copps, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. That was Honorable Sheila Copps, former Deputy Prime Minister. She joined us via Skype. NDP leader Tom Mulcair says Liberal Party leader Justin Trudeau's decision to publicize the sexual harassment allegations made by two NDP MPs against two Liberal MPs has actually victimized those women a second time. This after Trudeau went public with the allegations without the knowledge of the alleged victims. Liberal whip Judy Foote has been charged by Trudeau to take point on this issue. Foote has turned to the Board of Internal Economy to investigate. Joining us from Ottawa is Liberal Whip Judy Foote. Welcome to Context. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, thank you. Um, now, what's your response to Mr. Mulcair's claims? Let's start there. Well, Mr. Mulcair, um, with all due respect to him, um, Mr. Trudeau did not refer to any of the uh, personal misconduct allegations as sexual harassment. Uh, we did not name the MPs involved uh, in the other party, and we didn't say their gender. So in terms of anything that's gone public, it certainly didn't come from either Mr. Trudeau or myself. No, it's no secret that mere allegations can devastate the career of a public figure. Uh, your fellow MP, uh, Massimo Pacetti, says he, he did not even know the specific details of the allegations against him. At one point, were he and MP Scott Andrews briefed on the allegations? <laughs> When Mr. Trudeau asked me to investigate uh, the allegations that were brought to him by a member of another party, and again, I keep saying we've never, ever identified the party or the MPs or their gender. When he asked me to investigate to find out exactly what happened, of course I met with the two MPs of the Liberal Party and uh, told them of the allegations. Then I met with the two uh, MPs of the other party to get the details from them. It was pointless for me to get it third hand from another party, so I got it from the MPs themselves. And uh, I did not have the details when I met with the two Liberal MPs until I met with the two MPs of the other party. And when you say you didn't have the full details, would you have foreseen, okay, maybe I should wait to collect everything, or what was that process like? Um, and would you have changed it now looking back? No, it was, a re it was difficult. It's always difficult when, uh, when it involves MPs making allegations against uh, two MPs. It becomes that much more difficult, of course, when it involves MPs from two different parties. If it's within your own party, of course, you can deal with it. Uh, but when it involves MPs from another party, an MP, by the way, who chose to approach Liberal leader Justin Trudeau uh, with the allegation, telling him he needed to look into this, that there were, uh, these were allegations of personal misconduct, serious allegations, Against, uh, two M against two Liberal MPs, uh, against two other MPs. So when that happened, um, Mr. Trudeau had no choice but to, to act, and he did so by asking me to investigate. Now, former Deputy Prime Minister Sheila Copps has revealed that while a member of the Ontario legislature, she was sexually assaulted by a progressive conservative MPP. She told the Toronto Star there was no proper process for dealing with alleged sexual harassment on the Hill and added the secretive board of internal economy that oversee all that happens in parliament is not the proper forum. Um, it's not a parliamentary problem, she added. It's a society problem. Do you agree or disagree with those comments? Well, you know, the letter to the speaker was not to ask the board of internal economy to look into the particular situation we're dealing with today. It was to ask the speaker to find a a neutral third party. There are people out there who, who make a living at uh, helping people through situations like this, and one that would ensure confidentiality. So that was what we had asked the speaker to do, to put a process in place to reach out to those who have the expertise to deal with this. In terms of the Board of Internal Economy, it was to suggest that maybe the board should look at uh, on a go-forward basis, what do we do? There's no process here. Is it the board that should look into that, or should they do as they recommended today and pass it off to the uh, to PROC uh, and the Procedural Affairs Committee of the House of Commons? And that's what the board has decided to do. When the issue became issue became public uh, to the media, you were very much surprised that there was no process in place. Tomorrow, for example, where are we in this inv in this investigation? And how are things progressed as to bringing change to this? Uh, the spokesman for the board, who is the whip of the Conservative Party, uh, Mr. John Duncan, uh, spoke on behalf of the board to say that you know they're putting a process in place uh, to help with MPs and with their staff, uh, staff to staff, MPs to staff, staff and MPs. 
uh, what, however it might, the process might be or however uh, you know, an allegation may be brought forward in the future. Uh, and that's important, uh, but on the other hand, they're also going to uh, turn to PROC uh, to look at situations between MPs. And, and that's important process as well. Liberal Whip Judy Foote, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure, anytime. That was Liberal Whip Judy Foote joining us from Ottawa. How can sexual violence be countered in places where there are no whistleblowers? International Justice Mission Canada, or IJM, works to strengthen justice systems to protect the poor from violence, including victims of sexual violence and sex trafficking. IJM's Executive Director Ed Wilson is with us, and Kelly Cameron, the Student Mobilization Coordinator for IJM. Please let us welcome them to Context at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I want to start with you. What are you seeing in the study and in your experiences with uh, sexual violence on the global level? What we see on the global level, it's, it's, it's a worldwide issue. It's very pervasive. It's present in every society where we conduct operations. What we see, again, is that it's not predominantly an issue uh, involving organized crime, but it's, it's uh, low-level, everyday criminals who use their power over those who are weaker to extract something for their benefits, which oftentimes is personal profit, personal gain, uh, personal satisfaction. And, and, and looking at the work of IGM for both yourself, Kelly and, and, and Ed, um, you draw links, direct links to the way to stop sexual violence um, is a direct link between, hey, we got to beef up, we got to very much improve law enforcement and justice systems to, as a way to stop, stop violence, uh, sexual violence. In what way, what specifically does that look like? I think in, in, in most communities, there are typically four levels of protection. The okay. first level is the family. The second level are other community members. The third level would be private security agencies. And the fourth level is public law enforcement. Uh, I think of a situation with a young girl named Ulisa, a five-year-old girl from Bolivia. Ulisa was, uh, was raped by her uncle uh, and left for dead by the uncle, a community member found Ulisa, returned her to her parents. The, her, the mother reached out for help, but law enforcement wasn't available to help. So she reached out to IJM, we got involved, began to represent the concerns of the family, connected them with the public prosecutor and ensured that justice was done in Ulisa's case. So we see the, the need for the strengthening of public law enforcement agencies so they fill the gap uh, in the communities where we conduct our operations that they fill in our own cities. I, I want to come da back to that point. Uh, Kelly, you mm -hmm. have uh, worked with IJM in Cambodia yes. um, with those who have suffered sexual injustice. Um, give us that kind of... Um, wh what has your experience been on the ground? What kind of stories have you heard sh uh, shared with them? What, what are you seeing as, as it relates to this? Right. I think it's um, it's really interesting because IJM has been on the ground in Cambodia for just over 10 years now. And when we started, um, children were being uh, sold for sex with impunity. Um, basically, the, the public justice system was not working in terms of protecting uh, children from what we call commercial sexual exploitation or sex trafficking. And so over the past 10 years, we have seen huge changes because of um, us being able to strengthen the public justice system. So, for example, where when we started, um, we as there were estimates on the ground by research that about 15% of um, children under the age of 15 were, or I should put it this way, that in establishments that sex was for sale, about 15% of those within those establishments were children under the age of 15. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've recently had external researchers uh, do another study, and they have found that there's a 95% decrease in the availability of young children, for, so those under 15, to less than 1%. Oh, wow. And um, we really contribute that ch a major part of that change to the changes that we've seen in the public justice system. So in Cambodia, We've been able to do things like um, train the anti-human trafficking police. Uh, we work with the prosecutors and the judges in those systems. We have uh, investigators who work with the police to actually 
find these situations. Um, we have uh, social workers, which was the team that I was involved mm -hmm. with. Because it's not just enough to um, rescue uh, children from mm -hmm. sex trafficking, you also have to walk them through a process of healing. And so we mm -hmm. have great partners. In some of these developing parts of the world, um, sometimes systemically the legal and justice systems aren't as secure as they may be in places like Canada. Sometimes there's lots more corruption. Sometimes it's even more dangerous. You don't get the support you may feel you get going to these types of streams. Is it just as easy as, well, you know what, we need better law enforcement in these developing countries where that may be one of the sources of danger and problems itself. How would you respond to that? Maybe I'll start with Ed and, and then go from there. Well, it's certainly true. I mean, corruption is a problem in many of the societies and communities where we work, but, but it is not inevitable. It is, uh, we, are, we are convinced and we have proven to be true that in every community there are good men and women who are committed to the protection of the people of their communities and are prepared to work with us, sometimes at the risk of their own reputations. But I think the other thing that we need to do, and this is part of the methodology of VIGEM as well, is to work to build a social demand for change. Mm -hmm. uh, I think very often there is a sense of inevitability regarding some of these crimes, that that's just the way that it is. And the poor feel that they are not able to raise their voice, make their concerns heard to the extent that the, the authorities in their, in their countries will begin to respond to those problems. So we work through uh, agencies like the church and other community organizations to build a social demand for change, to encourage uh, the people of, of the communities to raise their voice and say these, these kinds of practices are not acceptable. They're not how we want to live. Ed Wilson, Executive Director of International Justice Mission Canada, and Kelly Cameron, Student Mobilization Coordinator with IJM. Thank you both for joining us. Very much for your context. Now coming up, function and dysfunction. We'll talk to a prominent therapist about the roots of gender-based violence, practical responses, and the role of God when things go right and when things go wrong. Stay with us. The only thing missing from today's conversation is you. To add your voice, call us at 1-800-215-4913. Email us at comments at contextwithlorna.com or reach us by Facebook or Twitter. We see, hear, read, and value all feedback. Click contextwithlorna.com to access exclusive web resources. Do a topical search on the subject you need to know. There's blogs, articles, links, and previous episodes. Life beyond the headlines. That's contextwithlorna.com. Taking a look at sexual assault in Canada now, women's service organization YWCA Canada released this infographic with a focus on the legal aspects surrounding violence against women. Take a look at this. It says there are 460,000 sexual assaults in Canada every year, and out of every 1,000 sexual assaults, 33 are reported to the police, 29 are recorded as a crime, 12 have charges laid, six, are prosecuted, three lead to conviction, and 997 assailants walk free. Now that information you're looking at, the data sourced from University of Ottawa criminology professor Holly Johnson, her research entitled Limits of a Criminal Justice Response, Trends in Police and Court Processing of Sexual Assault, it's actually part of a larger book called Sexual Assault in Canada, which contains the research of different feminist scholars, lawyers, activists, and policymakers examining the varying issues that Canadian women are facing. Time for some clinical insight into how and why sexual violence happens, how to react to it, how to prevent it, and the spiritual dimensions to this issue. My guest is a registered marriage and family therapist. Please welcome Sharon Ramsey to Context. Thank you so much for uh, joining us here. It's always a pleasure. I'm, I'm curious to know when you talk about you know bringing an end or stopping sexual violence, mm -hmm. it's a loaded, it's a complicated Absolutely. issue. Um, oftentimes it's hard to know where to start. Um, I'm curious to know if there's a spiritual component somewhere involved in, mm -hmm. um, and if you can identify it, is, that, is there something spiritual in bringing an end to this perhaps? Maybe the best way to say it is that I think that 
you can't talk about sexual ethics outside of a relational ethic. How are you in the world? Who are you in the world? Mm -hmm. So if you're in a situation, it's a little hard to start thinking, well, what should be happening right now? Because you're already in the situation. If we take a step back and consider what are your relational ethics? What role does mutuality have? Understanding, compassion, giving and receiving. You're talking about a broader way of being in the world. And so when we deny the fact that we have desires to be give, given to and also to receive, that there's an exchange that goes on, I think that sort of reveals a level of maybe some bankruptcy or some misunderstanding of what it is to be fully human. So there's someone who's watching the show and they may say, you know what, hey, I don't have a relationship with God, I'm not faith driven. Mm -hmm. They may be asking, and I want to ask you, yes. what is God's view of our sexual whole wholeness? What does that look like? Again, I want to back it up and say that we're not just sexual beings in the same way we're just not thinking beings. We are whole human beings. And part of what it means to be a whole human being is to have emotions, is to have thoughts, to behave, to have inclinations. I think God's perspective is that all of us is who he wants, not just one part, not just to poke a finger and say that's wrong. If, if someone says, okay, you know what, I'm someone of faith, I look at God as being the center of my mm -hmm. humanity, my existence. Okay. Um, and God looks at humanity as everyone being equal, all yes. men created equal. Mm -hmm. How does kind of a faith view, mm -hmm. taking that God perspective as our cue, work in, in the confines of sexual dynamics? Right. Oftentimes when, sometimes in cases, the power dynamics are really unbalanced. How does, mm -hmm. how does that work out there? So what I think about when you say that is, if God is all powerful, Mm -hmm. He rules, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yet, we oft often talk about in Christian circles that God is a gentleman. God never imposes himself on us. He always asks permission, is always asking about what is our will. And even if we decide that we don't want God, that's okay. So that's a, sort of a loftier divine perspective. Bring it down to human relationships. If you and I are in a relationship, I am not more than you, nor less than you. Mm -hmm. We are equal. And so how do we come together? How do we make relationship that allows me to be fully who I am, allows you to be fully who you are, that your thoughts, desires, and wishes have a place, as do mine? That, to me, is the beginning of a relational ethic that involves our sexuality. Someone taking their cues from the Bible, for instance, and they're mm -hmm. saying, you know what, I'm created in God's likeness, mm -hmm. you made me beautiful, etc." cetera. Um, a, a question of self-worth because the Bible oftentimes kind of says you know you're worth it you're like I said creating in his image yes. to someone who experiences sexual violence yes post that situation they may be feeling feelings of depression guilt self-blame mm -hmm. um, the list goes on and on um, how much can we take our cue from faith to say you know what if God sees you as being worth it beautiful mm -hmm. all those things mm -hmm. despite feelings you may be having the fear the anger if he sees you as being worth it see yourself as being worth it and speak out. It's gonna be difficult, it's not gonna right. be easy, but is there a cue we can take from that? So we talk, often talk about God being omnipresent mm -hmm. with us at all times. And one of the best ways to have that experience is to have someone else be, if you like, God with skin on, who is with us in the midst of that difficult situation. If I have been sexually assaulted and I turn to a friend, a family member, and I tell them, and what I get back is, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Why did it happen for you? That's not honoring of the experience that I've had or the need that I have right now to be comforted. I think that God comforts. What is God's heart towards the attacker mm -hmm. as well as the victim in this? So I think the witness of scripture, start to finish, Genesis to Revelation, is that God weeps mm -hmm. when his people are hurt. God is moved by the condition where we don't know where to turn, when there's confusion, when there's a sense of loss, loss of identity. God weeps for that, and the whole Christian story is about God redeeming that experience mm -hmm. of being alone. So I think for the victim, we need, as God with skin on, the community, to communicate God's presence, God's embrace. There's nothing we could possibly do that would separate us from the love of God. That has to be real, and the community of faith has to come alongside with that. For the perpetrator, mm -hmm. dare I say the same is true. However, there's also a, an accountability piece. Mm -hmm. So if someone has behaved incredibly badly, 
it's not enough for us to say, right, you, edge of the city, we're going to push you off the cliff and that's the end, because that person is also in need of change and redemption. Mm -hmm. So how do we make space for both and? Not to minimize the offense, but to say, this happened, this doesn't need to be your full experience, let's move towards change. You are a registered marriage and family therapist. Thank you so much for your insights and taking us uh, deeper. Appreciate that so much. You're welcome. Up next, some parting thoughts on a silent epidemic that's suddenly not so silent. Stay with us. Why just watch context when you can be part of it? To join our live studio audience in Toronto's CBC Broadcasting Centre, give us a call at 416-599-9777, extension 58, or email us at tickets at contextwithlorna.com. Click contextwithlorna.com to access exclusive web resources. Do a topical search on a subject you need to know. There's blogs, articles, links, and previous episodes. Life beyond the headlines. That's contextwithlorna.com. The only thing missing from today's conversation is you. To add your voice, call us at 1-800-215-4913. Email us at comments at contextwithlorna.com or reach us by Facebook or Twitter. We see, hear, read, and value all feedback. This segment is brought to you by Bruce Etherington and Associates. Family harmony and philanthropy helping you help others. Now, on the surface of it, you might think it's odd for a man to offer thoughts on anger and violence so often directed at women. But then, if men aren't learning, asking questions, and above all, listening, there can be no hope for real change. But I want to highlight that gender-based violence in any direction, whether the victim be a woman or a man, is wrong. The scales have to be balanced. And what's at stake is understanding why this is happening and ensuring this is proper or there are proper structures in place to ensure victims are protected. We heard from Sharon Ramsey. She spoke of spiritual dimensions to this issue. And in light of Jesus' example, and I use the word light deliberately, we're led to a Christian principle that transcends gender, that we treat everyone with respect and dignity, just as Jesus did and does for all who seek him. This is a story about healing, not just for victims, but predators too. The dialogue happening across Canada and also here today is a great start. But bear in mind that as you talk about it with those around you, there is a loving God present who would love to join the conversation. For Lorna Duick and all of us here at Context, I'm Sheldon Neal. Lorna returns next week, next week for more of Life Beyond the Headlines. We'll see you soon. Um, anytime we're talking about violence against women, we also tend to look at other countries. If we acknowledge in Canada that 460,000 women have experienced sexual assault and we are considered quote-unquote developed country, what are we doing to support our women, children here in ending violence against women? We cannot only seek justice or be concerned about justice, matters of justice and injustice on the global scale. We need to be responsive to, to issues at, at the local community level. I think there is, um, often we can look at issues within our own country and uh, kind of look for a solution that's outside of ourselves. And I think really starting with, um, with community, with community awareness and taking ownership of the issue um, within our various community groups is really important. It's not too late to send us your comments, voicemail, email, Facebook or Twitter. The conversation continues. <laughs>